Thanks so much for Anna Cornblue coming to join me today, have a little conversation via via Skype or whatever this is. And uh, I, I, I know I want to talk a lot about some like contemporary theoretical questions and then maybe talk about things that are specifically really interesting to you and then maybe come in around in the end to talk about certain novels and, and what, what you think about them. So that might be fun. Uh, but I want to start out with what you think. And I, I want to start, I, I, maybe this is wrong, but I want to start out with the negative. So I want to know what, what do you think is the chief theoretical danger today? You, in, in your great book, Order of Forms, you've talked about um, you, something you call anarcho vitalism and I, I think that's the term you use and I, and I'd like you I mean maybe you think it's that maybe you think it's something else but I'd like you to just maybe riff on that a little bit what you think is the real theoretical problem and then if you want to connect that to social problems you can but if we can just speak theoretically sure I guess the the thing that I might like to say um about a problem and with the caveat that of course I do want to talk about solutions or I think it's good for critics to talk about positive things. Uh, this is related to what the problem is. <laughs> um, that I think that there's a tendency now um, and by now one could say sort of the contemporary, the last uh, 40 years um, of theory to too closely mimic what it should be able to interpret, what it should have a meta or abstracting distance from. And in the order of forms I call um, the problematic formation or the one that concerns me anarcho-vitalism uh, because I think that there's a um, sense of unbounded energetic activity that is being hemmed in by institutions, by forms, by discourse, by the symbolic, and that um, criticism sort of sees its role as to puncture those things, right? To undo, to dismantle, to burn it all down, and therefore to unleash um, this freedom in formlessness. But I think you could call it a, a broader sort of dissolutionism too, a theoretical tendency to want to um, uh, only imagine that the, theor that the theorist who aggrandizes himself in so doing has a vocation of taking things apart, of objecting and dissenting, of subtracting and qualifying, mm -hmm. of um, impugning, right, of poking holes, sort of, and never to do synthetic compositional or projective work. And when I say that this is a problem of too closely mirroring, it's because uh, we, I think, li live in a non-society that <laughs> has had an overt um, uh, mandate from our ruling classes to take things apart, to incommode collective structures, scaffolds for um, supporting human flourishing, for the production of human life, as well as for um, collective meaning or values. So you think there's a real parallel between what's happening theoretically and what's happening on the societal level? Like the two are just working in conjunction as you see it. They're too close. Yeah. yeah. And, you know, that's just a kind of like a basic critical point. It's Marx's first kind of idea about the critique of political economy and about his version of critique of German idealism, right? right. Is that um, the reigning ideas, including those from our revered intellectuals, are actually, you know, proximate to in a kind of relation of determination by um, the ruling classes, by well, the formations. I think that's great, but isn't that funny that those people, I think, think of themselves as completely opposed to the way in which this, like, I, I think of, like, I think maybe just to name some people that you're thinking of, like Giorgio Agamben or Michel Foucault, he's dead, but I think he would be another one, and and and, and Foucault's descendants, right? Like, and Agamben is one of those, but I wonder if, if I mean, they think of themselves as completely fighting against the, the, so so your idea is that it, that this is just false consciousness on their part. They just they 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 know not what they do, right? Like they is that is that I the idea? That, that I think that there's just like um um uh inability to analyze um in critical terms what it means that the ruling ideas are those of the ruling class, um, and that's because there has been a systematic refutation of the terms of class of the terms of determination, of causality, right? These are of totality. These are, um, you know, theoretical uh, uh, bugbears, right? <laughs> you know, right. That, you know we, that, that we've had concerted agency against 
for a very long time, but that incommodes our, our analysis. You know, <laughs> we can't see that when our only sort of um, vision is that what institutions do is dominate or that the state is hopelessly corrupt and we're done theorizing that, um, <laughs> you know, then or that collective power is just always going to be um, exclusionary or exploitative. And so we should just hope for fugitivity. Right. Um, that, yeah, it, it is a kind of falsity. Um, it's been manufactured by a lot, you know, m many generations now of <laughs> theoretical tradition. Yeah. Yeah, it's interesting that I, I know this is true in order of forms, and I, I know you have a you had a I think you had a personal relationship with him, but it's interesting to me how Derrida, who I would see as in some way responsible for this, like isn't deconstruction the undermining of institutions and structures and forms, and and yet I think you're a little friendlier to him than you are to like Deleuze, Foucault, and the other people that are kind of associated with him. Maybe you could say why that is I know because I, I I'm I'm sort of not and maybe it's just because of your I think you had it you knew him right I think that was well he taught he taught at Irvine where right. I would go for many years I did take his last classes there um I don't know that it's the relationship that I it, you know I don't I don't feel like I had a particularly strong relationship okay. Okay. um but I think that it's that um I actually think that deconstruction is much more ambivalent about power and about epistemology than something like the biopolitical paradigm is. Okay. Um, and so I, it's, you know, I think that there's just like a, a more energy for questioning and less kind of um, conviction um, about the anatomy of domination, a less conviction about what all of Western epistemology has done. I all think right. deconstruction is skeptical of the um, kind of ahistorical absolutizing nihilist gestures that I would associate with uh, theoretical dissolutionism. Okay. Um, yeah. 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 That's that's good. I, I like that. And I, I I mean, I've always but I wonder what you would think of this, because I've always linked. I've always thought Derrida and Adorno were kind of doing the same thing. But I think Adorno comes off much worse for you. So I wonder if you could tell me how they're and, and this this I guess it's a larger question about where you think psychoanalysis and Marxism have kind of gone awry, because that's a it, it, I think. I think you would identify this movement, this, I don't, like, I'm not sure if it would be biopolitical within those structures, but some kind of like vitalist right. tendency within even psychoanalysis and Marxism, which I think you identify yourself with as, as, as I do maybe to less extent than you do about Marxism, but that's a whole other thing. Um, so I wonder about that. So, so, so is that, First of all, do you think that there's a link between Derrida and Adorno, or is there a difference? And then has Marxism and gone down this Adornian path? Is that really where you see the problem? Oh, yeah. Okay. Those are hard questions. Yeah. I'm, sorry. That was terrible. No, no. It's not terrible. I like hard questions. It's just, um, I guess I think that uh, one could, I, I like, I really haven't thought well about Derrida in relation to Adorno. I think that um, negativity and like what is critical, critical negativity and what is the kind of movement of critical thought. Um, I do think that there is a, um, a quality of unbridled negativity in both of their thoughts. Yeah. And so then the problem is sort of like, where is the dialectical negation of, of negation, right? Like what what lends itself towards synthesis in their thought? And I think that, you know, in late Derrida, there's obviously a lot of effort to come up with some positive terms like friendship. Right and justice and right, right. that um, are supposed to, re to represent certain kinds of, albeit ever receding, but, you know, possible goods, right? right, right? right. And I think that Adorno is is less ambivalent than Derrida in terms of what the goods are, right? Um, yeah. They are uh, immediate art forms that help us to um, think about uh, how, like, the merely phenomenal, stupid, and indeed fascistic world and the administered world is not the only possible thing here, right? right. Um, so the, the artworks kind of departure from, from the ordinary business, right? Is our reminder that things could be otherwise. And so I actually feel like sympathetic to Adorno on that front, um, right. Right. Um, and the way that he wants to think about um, the what the 
it's it's the dialectical potential and the creative energy. I do think that he, there's a real utopian and dialectical, properly dialectical trajectory of this kind of affirmation of mediation that he you know puts forward. Um, so for I, on the artwork especially, yeah. that's where you yeah. think, yeah. yeah. I mean, so I, you know. Um, Right. I think on the artwork more than in just sort of generic thought. Yeah. yeah. I think he's more hopeful in some ways about art than about philosophy. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, and so then the, I guess the question is, if are these um, tendencies of unbridled negativity or of um, a kind of resistance to synthesis, um, are those also to be found in psychoanalysis and Marxism? Yeah. And I think in particular, early fusions of psychoanalysis and Marxism suffered from a kind of, um, you know, a false uh, picture of unbridledness or of, right. you know, a fusion, right? What is right. liberation and so on? Right. Um, I think that it is not good if in the name of either psychoanalysis or Marxism, there is a kind of projection of a um, antagonism free future <laughs> of right. a possible social order that is um, whole or anchored or that is happy or where people, you know, experience more joy or something like that. Um, you know, so I think there are certain kinds of like, you could call them like uh, hippie, maybe Marcusian. <laughs> you know? Right, right, right. Um, to sort of um, appropriate psychoanalysis and Marxism as um, uh, inquiries into possible um, wholenesses or greatnesses or um, abundances of pleasure um, and of social belonging. And I think that those are both tendencies that are, I don't think in any way true to say Freud's political theory or even to, you know, um, Marx's kind of account of the ungroundedness of human uh, society. So you don't think that has a, a an origin in Marx himself, really? You don't think that, that, sense of, of of a production of a harmonious social is not implicit in the Marxist project. No. Interesting. I really don't. And I know you and I have disagreed about this before, yeah. and I think others might disagree. But I think that the way that he, especially in his early works, kind of defines um, what materialist inquiry into human experience is, it's not about um, harmony, Right. It's about differentiation. Right. That's what they think nature does. That's what human beings right. do. That's what um, it is about the sort of just weirdness um, uh, materially of the human as an animal and the fact that there is uh interdependence that's just this like kind of problem for human beings that isn't quite the same level for other animals and that that's what makes man a political animal which is an right. Aristotelianism that is absolutely axiomatic for Marx right. you know um, and that um, it means that there's a kind of open question of like what's a social order <laughs> what sustain what's a framework for sustaining life um, and I think that's in the early Marxian anthropology in a, in a formative way. And, you know, there are bombastic kinds of gestures um, in some of the political writings. But, you know, but and I think that in but even the manifesto doesn't like prophecy social wholeness. Right. But doesn't he say that capitalism is the last antagonistic economic form in human history? I mean, doesn't he? He does say that, right? I mean, it's simplifies the antagonisms. Does he say it's the last one? I think he does. Yeah. I'm sorry, but I, yeah, I think he does. I mean, I, and then I, I guess I, for me, I know German ideology is important work for you. Right. And I, and I agree. I think it's important, but I mean that, that image, it's one of the few images he has of the communist future, you know, where he says you're going to be a, what does he say? A farmer in the morning, a hunter in the, the day, a critic in the afternoon and without ever becoming a hunter. And that seems to me, something that you would really resist in the way that I would, because it seems like to me, like Deleuze must have read that and like, really, he might, I mean, he might, he might pleasure himself to that text at nights, right? Like, it's a really, I think it's so important for like that whole breakdown. I mean, that's a celebration of the breakdown of identity, the breakdown of subjectivity, right? In the, it, 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 like we become just this pure action. And I wonder if that's not, oh, you know, if that's not a kind of notion of harmony that, I don't know, maybe it's, maybe you don't think so. So what I see there is differentiation and then a differentiation that refuses the division of labor, right? So 
it is that I can engage in these activities. It's true without taking on an identity, uh, right? Without bec ever becoming Hunter Hertzman or critic, right? right? Um, but that is, I don't think identity in this, in a, any kind of psychoanalytic sense of a, of a subject who has um, contradictions and, and residues that are different from their action, right? Yeah. I think it is identity in the sense of um, a professional, you know, um, kind right. of you are slated into this niche within the um, division of labor, right? Um, I, I mean, I can see why all that multiplicity seems like a romantic, like then I'll get to do everything. But indeed, it's not a very comprehensive description, right? Um, it's, right. It, 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 <laughs> right? There's a lot that's about animals, which is presumably about food. I, recently, in fact, I had occasion to post that quote on some like Facebook exchange. And um, one of my uh, least favorite contemporary liberals said to me, gosh, communism is really going to suck for animals. You know, <laughs> <laughs> and it's just sort of like, wow, if that's really the way that you want to interpret um, this, you know, kind of conviction to a kind of life that isn't governed by the um, the way that the division of labor is oriented uh, to uh, optimize profit for a few and to alienate the co creative capacities of humans, I think that's that's an impoverished way of thinking about it right so i guess the issue is if marx really thinks that what human beings are are creative right they make right, right. i accept that right yeah. they that's what they do they want to make right right um, uh that's what that there's a kind of drive there um and that it is what makes work artsy also and right. um right. if he really thinks that i could see you know some neoliberal Google delusion, as Galloway calls them, you know, kind of um, apotheosizing of like unbridled creativity as like, I, you know, converging somewhere with anarcho vitalism. I guess you might yeah. see that. But to me, the sort of uh, interesting thing in that formula even is like the way that it's trying to keep contradiction alive, right? So I'm not, you know, the, the, the animal work and the body work and stuff is like different than the, the, I, the idea work. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it has yeah. a different time of the day. And then, um, that you could do things without being things. Right. So, yeah. Yeah. That makes sense to me. I, I, I guess, I, I guess I, this notion of, I guess the problem is I see that there is this slight, Slight. I mean, I, I take your point that there that that there's a in, that I like that idea that he's really even in this example he's kind of trying to keep this contradiction between the mental and physical labor alive. Although you don't have to obviously, so you would almost in turn it's like taking the external contradiction and internalizing it because you would exist in both in both ways. I, I like that. I think that's pretty good. I guess the the notion though that that. Um, so I, my question is, though, does do you think Marx has a notion of a necessary alienation in the way that Freud and psychoanalysis and Hegel does like that? Because I think neither of his notions of Entäußerung or what's the other one? I, I forget the other one from the from the 1844 manuscripts like but neither of those notions of alienation, I think, for him is a necessary alienation. Right. Like there's still like there's still this idea of overcoming that, that communist society would be the overcoming of alienation. I think you would not like that, right? Like you want to insist that there's a, like even the in, the way you insist on the institution is yeah. a way of insisting on the necessity of alienation. So I guess, I just wonder if you feel in your own self a kind of tension between Marxism and psychoanalysis. That's the, really what I want to know if you feel that at all. That is such a good question. So how does a Marxist like materialist account of human being um, allow for or account for a necessity of alienation? Um, and I don't know if I have a, a good answer to that. Um, I mean, I think that there is um, the kind of energy and verb with which Marx is always theorizing the forms of appearance of social life and um, the kind of way that there's for him all that is intellectually generative comes from this kind of split between like the fact of social relations and then the fact that those don't appear as themselves, right? Um, that like you can't touch capitalism, you can't touch totality, you can't touch value, right? So what are the constructs whose um, analytical 
decomposition um, allows us to sort of, um, you know, produce a, a, a notion of a, of a system, of its metaphysical entailments, <laughs> of um, how it's structuring our social life, and therefore of its contingency and uh, how there could be other systems. So I think that um, historical materialism is, is in its accounting of the contingency of modes of production and the contingency of made human history and then the interdependence of human life, um, you know, has a fairly good account of why society can never not be alienated. Right. But is there within there an expression of why the individual could, you know, has an intrinsic yeah. alienation? You know, I mean, he is a theorist of consciousness that doesn't um, adequately grasp its surroundings, right? I mean, to go back to where we sort of started with this, right. about, um, what is the critique of idealism, right? It fails to inquire into its own environment. It fails to inquire into social reality. It fails. But, but he does. Mm -hmm. but he does. I mean, he thinks that he does in a way that I think Freud, Freud understands that there's this like foreign thing in me. Right. And I don't think Marx. I mean, obviously, I don't want Marx to anticipate psycho. I don't think that's impossible. I think that's impossible. But uh, I do like there 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 doesn't seem to be a notion of an internal like limit or blockage in Marx in the same way that there is for Hegel and for Freud and I guess and then that I wonder if that's what allows you to use this term that I, I never use which is flourishing because I wonder if flourishing isn't the like I hear people say this all the time and it just drives me crazy because I don't think anyone's ever tried to flourish. Like I think, I think people get off as we're going to see tomorrow in this election and it's, and it's, it's aftermath. People get off on destroying themselves. So I don't think anyone's trying to flourish. And I, I think the notion of a flourishing seems to me to be, I mean, I think it is compatible to, to the extent that it's compatible with Marxism is the extent to which I'm not a Marxist. Like I, I feel like there's, you know, there's, he doesn't, get this way in which this divide within the self, this like, you know, wrenching of the self to, to like form itself, even in your terms, like to form itself that, that actually cuts into the self. And I don't think, so I think you're right about Marx's product, this emphasis on our productivity and our creativity, but that creativity always has to cut in to the subject. Yeah. And without that, you're not creative. I don't know. So, so I'm so, sorry. I, I kind of polemical there. I think that's great. I mean, I think that's a really important distinction. And I guess the problem is, um, what do you think if, if you don't like flourishing, like when I use it, I use it because I believe, as I said at the beginning, it's important for critics to have positive values. It's important for us to have synthetic formulations of alternatives, right? Um, we can make ideas, you know, not just take ideas apart. Right. And so, um, we know that we live in a regime of domination and exploitation, right? What's the alternative to that? And to me, um, flourishing is, I think it's a good name, not for um, wholeness or for um, unalienated expansiveness, right? But for um, something, some kind of growth and creativity that is above the bar of mm -hmm. domination and exploitation. Like what do you, you know, I mean, I guess that there's a thing about necessary and unnecessary suffering, right? So Marx is really interested in unnecessary suffering, right? right, right? right. He's interested in how, if we have so much technology and we have so much human wealth and so much social wealth and so much creativity, how can we make it so that our social system nonetheless immiserates people? Right? right. So he's interested in unnecessary suffering. Right. Freud's interested in necessary suffering. Whether Marx would refuse the notion of necessary suffering, I I think we could keep debating. Yeah, that. yeah, yeah. Which is maybe un uninteresting. But yeah, I really like what you said. Sorry. You need Sorry. to have a language for why it's unnecessary, and that does in fact imply some norms. Like yeah. people should have food. <laughs> no, I agree. See, here I, I do agree with you. I mean, I even though I, I don't like that term flourishing, I still think I'm not sure that there's really that much distance between us. But, you know, that that distinction that you're making, it's funny because it's a bad book. I think we neither of us like it. But Herbert Marcuse's Eros and Civilization, you know, he develops this notion of surplus repression, like there's a necessary repression. And then there's a, and I've always thought that's a really good 
that's a really important, I mean, I, I wouldn't use repression as the main term, but I think that's a really important way to think about, say, suffering, right? Like there's a certain necessary suffering of just being alive. And then there's this additional suffering that's maybe unnecessary. And I, this brings me to a thing I really loved about your book, although I'm not sure if I agreed, but which is why I probably why I loved it. But but when you said we can imagine another society, it won't be more satisfying but it'll be more just. And I thought, wow, I really loved that formulation because I think most people who call for another society, they call for it because it'll obviously give us more satisfaction, more enjoy- whatever the term you use, enjoyment, chewy sounds. But I love this idea that it could be more just without being more satisfying. I wonder if you could just talk about what, maybe you just thought that's a really great sentence and I don't have any further idea. I do that all the time. Um, but maybe you have an idea further about what that means. And I, I wonder if, cause I just, I'm not sure. Like I, 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 I'm not my, I guess my question to you, I wrote this to you. Like, do, do you think, do you think we would really act to realize it if it's more just like, do we ever, if like, if I think you and I agree that we mostly act for our enjoyment or our satisfaction. So what would get someone to act for justice, if they know the new society is not going to be any more satisfying, right? Fighting for someone they don't know. I mean, and also just, you know, it, it's to me, it's just extremely simple <laughs> that there are all kinds of advanced capitalist countries that have far more humane organization, even though they're still capitalist, than America does. And that is actually a discrimination worth making, you know, that universal health care actually helps people. They suffer less. They don't have to yeah. have meta worry about being sick. They can just be sick, right? Um, I mean, you know, obviously there are certain limitations of certain kinds of ways of configuring that. Universal child care helps children, helps women, <laughs> helps people, you know. So these there, there are, I think, basic kind of configurations of social democracy that actually are about more justice, um, about freeing people to still be neurotic, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So um, what? But then they would want to take a step further beyond like social democracy, right? And to think, you know, what is your vision of what are you what do you want to positively hazard for what we should do when we're not governed by the law of surplus extraction right yeah, that's good no that's really great what my here's my follow up like what do you why couldn't it be more satisfying why wouldn't that be more why did you say that i i am just curious why wouldn't you say it would be more satisfying because i think that we if we want to have um what psychoanalysis teaches us right if we want to have a, a social order that permits less neurosis um, and less psychosis, that that social order needs to be structured very differently than it is now. Yeah. And you could have the same kind of fundamental balance of um, symbolic regulation and imaginary projection and imaginary support of that and um, you know, phantasmatic um, incorporation of and phantasmatic ejection of the real, like that same kind of constellation psychically and linguistically in a social democracy and perhaps even in a communism, right? And this is where I wanted to turn the question back around to you about necessary suffering and psychoanalysis because there is an end of analysis, you know? There, there, psychoanalysis may be an account of why human beings under bourgeois Cartesian modernity um, necessarily suffer, but it's also a practice, a, a dialogic and institutional practice of trying to um, change the valence of that suffering, right? To enable people to take up a new relation to language and a new relation to the other and therefore to themselves, right? Yeah, yeah. So you're turning the question back on me. I'm, I'm, I want to answer this question. So, so I, I don't like usually to quote someone when I answer some, a good question, but I, I think my position is exactly his. So I think, and I, I have certain distances from Lacan, probably because I don't like him personally very much at all. But, but, um, but nonetheless, I'm I'm pretty aligned with him. But on this question, I'm totally aligned with him. So in in the four fundamental concepts of psychoanalysis seminar, 
he has this great, I think it's on page 168 in the English translation, because I just, that's so glued in my mind. So, so I think his, his idea is like, what justifies our intervention as analysts, which is the question you just raised. Mm -hmm. And he says, it's not that we're going to provide more satisfaction or take away dissatisfaction. It's that people give themselves, and this is his exact term, I think, tro de trouble, too much trouble for their satisfaction. And we're just going to we're going to make the circuit shorter. That's what he says. We're, we're going to give them a little, we're going to, and this is, you know, Slavoj has a whole book series called Short Circuits. Mm -hmm. And I think that's the, I guess that's my idea of the psychoanalytic intervention. And that's why I was so drawn to your statement that we're not going to make another society that's more satisfying because there's a basic structure of satisfaction. You can't get more of it. What you can do, and maybe, I wonder if you would accept this, that maybe making a society more just is actually doing that is actually creating that short circuit and 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 ca causing less trouble yes. like we have all this trouble to get our satisfaction in capitalist society but right. maybe in communist society we would have much less trouble to get our satisfaction i don't know that would be for that would be my response yeah i think that's right and i think that that is actually an account of um say conditions in contemporary life that really really resonates with young people right um that our way of organizing economic relations is making people miserable. Right. It's giving them anxiety. It's giving them depression. It's giving them um, anhedonia, you know, um, and all kinds of um, related uh, crises and existential explorations of like what sex is and what sexuality is and what identity is, you know, um, pleasure <laughs> is, is in doubt, right? Um, pe right? People are being given by their social order of things terrible uh, psychic conditions. Yeah. And that's sort of like knowledge that our young people have, I think. Yeah. 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 I mean, I, I noticed my, my twin boys, like they, there's like, they're like constantly on the verge of depression, you know, like it's just, uh, you know, probably because I'm their father, but maybe it's because of these social, these social kind of things. And I think it is like, there's so much, there's like so much pressure and there's so, there's so, and there's all these different, you're constantly bombarded by everyone else's enjoyment. Like that's the other thing that's just incredibly suffocating today. Uh, anyway, so yeah, I totally, I think that's a great point. I really like that idea. Um, I want to cut. We haven't even talked about form yet. And that's the main thing I want to talk to you about. So why form? Like, why is form for you so fundamental? I mean, I, this is an issue. I have no, there's no distance between us at all. I totally agree with you, but I just want you to articulate it. So what, why is form so important for you? Um, so I think in, we actually alluded to this a little bit earlier in the um, kind of Marxist procedure you can't just like analyze stuff because then you're just, <laughs> you know, you're just kind of talking undirectedly about, you know, consciousness, right? Um, and if you want to have a more rigorous interventive analytic, you need to talk about the shape of things. <laughs> you need to talk about the contours um, that make them available to analysis. So the modes of appearance or the kind of um, forms like the commodity that help us understand that capitalism is a system that we live in and not communism, right? Yeah, yeah. Um, so for him, analysis always starts with form. And I just think that it, there's a revelatory power there. Also for him, human existence is dependent upon form, right? We animals don't just, human animals don't just spring out of the ground ready to walk or feed themselves, right. right? We're dependent and we need some kind of structure of that dependency. And, you know, different societies over time have given it different structures and that variability um, is what holds out the promise that like we could have a different one in the future right but so um you need form for life you don't just get life <laughs> mm -hmm. but then what form do you want it to take i think that is a way of framing these like really fundamental um political questions and then um you know in the study of art um or literature or film or music um when you think that people human beings who exert their creative labor for the purpose of making representations that um, depart from what's already here, right? They're giving us more than the stupid already existing world. Um, that form is the, um, is the product of their labor. It's the, it's the boundedness that emerges from their creative production. And it's what is available to us to pay attention to, right? Yeah. 
Yeah, I think I really like that. I, I mean, I, I I wonder if you could talk about the relation between form and content because would you? This is just crazy, I think. But would you maybe think that that capitalism is a, a, a epoch of like it, it 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 suffocates us with content and blinds us to form, and so the whole maybe. I, I'm not going to say Marxist, but the leftist emancipatory project is to pay. This is what I would say: is to pay attention to form mm -hmm. and not get blinded by content. And that the the one thing that capitalism and its whole ideological apparatus doesn't want us to do is to pay attention to form, because that's the point at which it, the whole thing comes into question. Yeah. Yeah, I think that's really good. I mean, I think in the sense in which you're using it, form actually means like the form of this particular mode of production or the structure of our social relations now. Right. That that what, um, of course, our oligarchic overlords want us to believe in is the stories they tell and not the realities that they have wreaked, you know? Right. Right. Um, so I think that I would uphold, yeah, that kind of distinction in that um, case. Um, I, but, you know, of course, one doesn't want an undialectical form content. Of course, right. Right. right, right. So um, certainly um, in many other aesthetic periods than the contemporary, there is a, a, a kind of dissonance between form and content, which is what helps produce the idea uh, that, uh, that the content is even uh, you know, right, right. I mean, you you mentioned the new critics in your book, Order of Forms, and I kind of like new criticism, but I think they're guilty of what you just said, right? Like they kind of they hypostasize form mm -hmm. and make form, and then and then they miss the way in which the content can actually shape and dial. There's a whole dialectic at stake. I think that's right, and that seems really good to me. I wonder. I wonder about this idea of realism as a form, because I think. I really like that. I think it's great. But again, I think that's a something that I that must have been, I don't know, you can tell me, that must have been really disruptive in the field, right? Like that to because I think most people think of realism as rep you do a lot to talk about how it's not representation and you you make this kind of distinction. Uh and I wonder if it was it disruptive and maybe you can explain how realism can be a form and not a uh, not mimetic, I guess. So you, uh, so Eric Orbach, who wrote this book by Mises, you talk about, um, really is invested, and I think a lot of people are invested in the idea of realism as mimesis. Mm -hmm. And I wonder if you can talk about how it's not that and how it's form and why we should accept that. For sure. Um, so I think that. Uh, what I'm trying to get across is that that realism is an art. That means that it has certain kinds of principles that we can't actually identify. That it's not a refusal of aesthetic composition. That it is not mimesis. That it is not formlessness. That it is not trying to negate its own medium. That. In fact, <laughs> it has uh, principles like balancing social breadth with psychic depth. It has principles like balancing internal uh, detail and external detail or um, environment and subjectivity. It has um, principles ordin often, not always, but of um, producing a highly anti-real um, consciousness from which that is, that's the narrative point of view, right? Omniscience, <laughs> third person. This is a problematic consciousness that nobody gets to have in the real world, right? It's a conspicuous artifice of, <laughs> Only, you know, only available in fiction, right? Like, you know, I mean, there are certain arguments that cameras are omniscient, but like there is a really, there are whole um, amazing, you know, inventions in, in literary history that obtain around, you know, this manufacture of this anti-phenomenal consciousness that is yeah. third person, that is omniscience, that is, right? So it's highly formed um, and it's involved in projections of, um, possible social relations. It's involved in um, presenting the integrality and um, structuring of, uh, of social realities that resemble our phenomenal realities. You know, it's not like time travel or stuff like right. that, right? right? Then you're outside of the generic prescriptions, right? Um, but that are dislocated. And, you know, to go back to that, like, um, it's more just, but it doesn't satisfy us more. Or also a formula I think you like um, that um, after the revolution, everything will be the same except a little bit different. A little different, right? yeah. yeah. So that realism is like, why would you bother just copying things, right? It's making that a little bit different, yeah. which in, in many ways I think is about the aspiring to this um, uh, perspective that could even kind of um, imagine sociality or imagine 
you know, um, the, the, the collectivity. Um, how could we get to that? That would be the little yeah. bit. Yeah. And so, yeah, that's really, that's great. I love that answer. And I, I think that, you know, like the, especially the contrast between what you mentioned phenomenality. So I, it's been interesting to me that the novel, like the, 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 a rise of phenomenology as a mode of thinking, I think gets, I think the novel gets grouped with that, yeah. especially, and then I was thinking of, I, I don't like this book at all, but I was thinking when you mentioned that phenomenon, I was thinking of the notebooks of Malta Lourdes Friga, the, the real, which I, I just hate, but I know a lot of our friends love it. Like, Eric, like yeah. Eric Sandner loves it. He thinks it's maybe, I think he probably thinks it's the greatest novel I've ever written. And, and I think that's such a, I don't really like, I hate these films that are like this too, that are phenomenal, right? Like that, that are trying to give you an experience rather than give you a form. And I wonder, does this make you not like modern literature? Cause it doesn't modern literature, like you're a Victorianist. So I wonder if you think, I mean, I don't want to label you, make you into, you know, cause we're, we're, we're aspiring to a society where you're not just what you do, but, oh, but, oh, but I wonder what you think about it. Does that, does modernism tilt too far into this phenomenal and that's what, and, and so do you kind of recall, I mean, I, I guess I share that, but I, I, for me, like I'm reading, I'm teaching a class on Kafka right now. And, and I feel like Kafka, like what you're saying about, even though he's not a realist, I, he's a modernist clearly, but I feel like he, all the things you're saying about form, that's just true about Kafka. So I wonder, I'm sorry, this is a terrible question, but how, I wonder how you think about this relationship to the phenomenology yeah. and then how you think about how you would think about modern literature in terms of what you think about form? Yeah, no, I think those are great questions. Um, so phenomenologically speaking, I think that um, what is that realism just has a constitutive anti-phenomenality. Like, I really think that's just crucial. No matter how much detail is, no matter how much psychological introspection there might be, um, there is the project to produce that knowledge in dialectical relation to exterior knowledge, to multiple other characters, to the hypotheticalness of this social world that's being described, and again, to um, the unattainability, unexperienceability of the consciousness of the third person or of any kind of omniscience, right? Um, and and it's certainly free and direct discourse. So, um, well, that I was just going to say, is that a big thing for you, free and direct discourse? Yeah. yeah. I mean, I follow Frances Ferguson and her notion that like it's the novel's one contribution to the history of form. And, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Um, and, you know, and it's tremendous because it's, you know, something that is speaking that is not a person. Right. It is a non subjective, non phenomenal um, linguistic functioning. I think it has a lot in common. It's a, it's a psychoanalytic form in that way. Right? Yeah, yes, yes, um, yeah. But so then, as far as modernism goes, I actually think that there's still such, um, in many places, um, really uh, lush and um, spastic and abstract kind of effort to play with um, what uh, what it means to have consciousness not belong to a single body, <laughs> right? Mm -hmm. um, that I that I think it still has a kind of anti-phenomenal quality, um, but it's you know it's. Uh, interest in um, something like producing a individual text which accounts for the logics of the social world at quite the scope that realism does. It you know, do it doesn't do that in the same yeah. way. I mean, you know, you know, there are cases to be made, but it's not, that's not quite its project, right? Yeah. What I really find troublingly phenomenalist <laughs> is phenomenological um, is contemporary fiction. Really? Uh, yeah, so um, the just, you know, absolute hegemonic dominance of the first person in contemporary literary fiction, uh, the um, project of autofiction, the what we might call the memoirizing of fiction, yeah, yeah. Um, you know, the kind of importation of the protocols of the successful memoir marketplace, <laughs> the boundlessly successful memoir marketplace yeah. into um, fiction. Um, I find all of those things an effort to, you know, stamp out the what fiction promises, which is yeah. that you could cr construct a point of view that none of us get to have in our stupid body. You know, could you do you think it's possible to write a memoir like that or not? So, um, do, you know, I was just reading something about um, 
and Helen Peterson's book about the burnout generation and memoirized, she makes that book. And like, you know, is there just a fundamental antipathy between the memoir form and like consciousness? Yeah. You know, I'm a little bit tempted to say, yeah, that like the I pronoun, unless it has like a structure of self differentiation in it, um, and memoirs are usually like tight time frames and like, you know, n- not often characterized by um, something like the prolepsis that we get in like a rare first person fiction in the Victorian period, like uh, The Lifted Veil or Great Expectations or something. Um, I, yeah, and like this thing that I'm trying to write now about contemporary fiction, I, I have a Ulupo device of not using the first person at all in the whole book, um, in the first person singular. But yeah, I'm trying yeah. to figure out, does first person plural suffice for that? That's a very attacked thing, right? Theorists hate the we. <laughs> I know, I know, they do. I know, I know. So, so you're, we're going to skip a little ahead, but I want to come back to this realism question because, God, I, I, I have just such a, a lot to say, ask about certain novelists, I, especially Dickens, who, who, thanks to you and a, another friend of mine, I've kind of really fallen for. Um, uh, but but my question is like what what does the what's this book going to be called you know like immediacy or it's like immediacy it needs a title maybe you can tell me because okay just, well maybe somebody will write in and give you yeah. a title so <laughs> so uh, all right so so I guess my question is like d- what do you think of these new theoretical forms where they're bringing like the first the the, the like the it becomes kind of like auto, what do they call it? Even auto theory, right? So this is one of the things, this is grist for your mill probably, right? Yes, remember we were talking about theory being too close to its object. Right? Yeah, so this would be the example of that. This yeah. would be an example of that. Yeah, that um, uh, that the interest in producing theory as memoir, um, and the interest in um, generic indistinction and in a kind of blurring um, that is not actually serving the pr- project of criticism, which is to cut. It yeah. is to make discernments. Um, and the hyper-personalization, right, the problem in memoir is how do you, if ever, get from the personal to something more significant, right? And, you know, people can say, well, I suffered because of this healthcare system, or I, you know, I suffered because of sexism or racism, right? But um, how, how do you actually, like, kind of scaffold a syntax and, a, um, you know, a set of projections that conduce to values that are for people to do something other than um, think about their own memoir? <laughs> you know, either to feel themselves mirrored or to feel. And so for theory, similarly, um, there are incredibly passionate um, and um, beloved, you know, theory memoirs written in the last 20 years or being written now, you know, by our intersex friends and our, our um you know, people about their experience as a, you know, woman of color in the academy or so on and so forth. And they, um, it's not clear to me how, what they enable as far as collective thinking. One wants our forms to, um, you know, solicit us into kinds of attention, but also kinds of thinking that are counter to what we already have available in everyday life. Yeah, yeah. That's really good. I I wonder if, um, what do you think about Freud's autobiographical study? (laughs) Wow. Um, that's interesting. That's really interesting. And I, I haven't reread it while I've been thinking about auto theory, and I absolutely should. I think that he was always so um, so anxious about and excited about speculation that almost all of his theoretical works have this kind of self-doubt um, and self-relativizing um, yeah, yeah. and then self maybe aggrandizing in a certain way, you know, like that there's, it's not like there's not a self in the non-autobiographical studies. And then I think it is absolutely foundational for Freud that you can't do self-analysis, right? right and right. he has to elaborate why that is, but it, this is just like why psychoanalysis, you know, if you like, is not a personal discourse, right? Is because it only happens between two people All or right, right, some right. fashion. Um, so I think that he needed to make that point as strongly as possible you know what were the limits that he could study of himself and what were the things he couldn't do but 
you're right that I have, I really haven't read it since grad school. And so. Yeah, no, it's just interesting. I mean, I, I, cause I think, I, th- I guess what I, I, I would bring it back to your term cut, right? Like, like even though Freud's writing about himself, he's writing about a cut in himself and about what's alien to himself within himself. And that's, that's what I think is really, so then I think, I, I guess, I think that most, you know, maybe the memoir form can't do that, but there is a kind of form that can do that. Like I know, like Mari Rudy just wrote a book called Penis Envy, and uh-huh. and it's a it's a it has a lot of stuff about growing. You know, she grew up in Finland, like abutting the Iron Curtain, <laughs> like she was right against the Soviet Union. So and and just in like incredible poverty. It, it, it it's just inc- you know, it, it, but it's not a it's not she doesn't include that to to make you feel whatever for her. she includes it to show the way in which her own subjectivity is is like riven into you know and so so that for her like theory is this thing that actually lifts her up out of that so it's it's kind of it's used in a way to kind of, to almost to say this is just unimportant because it just serves as this thing that then I'm I'm able to distance from so I and I think in, there's a similar kind of cut in Freud. And so I wonder if there's, there is some kind of ability. I'm just trying to defend it maybe because I do. And I like constantly reference my own stupid things in my books. But um, I just, I, I wonder if there's an ability to like in, to bring that in and then, and still have it be where like it's serving the theory rather than, I think what you're talking about is almost vice versa. Like if there's theory, it's just really serving this like self apology. Right. Yeah. Right. So I think it's like, where do you get the dissonance or where do you get the impetus? Right. And so an anecdote is not a memoir, <laughs> you know, right. but a memoir might be a list of anecdotes. <laughs> like, you know, right, right, like right, right. you can have illustrative lessons. And also, if you're going along in some like theory book about like, what is the philosophy of comedy? And then you're like, and then my toddler said, <laughs> it's a shift of register. And that shifting is important to um, the kind of project conceptually of theory, which is about not coinciding too much, not imminentizing itself with its object, right? About distance. Yeah. Um, or, you know, you don't have to spatialize the distance, but you have to, you can metalepsize it. You you know, there has to be like a, a dissonance of sorts, um, a non, a non commensurability, right? Yeah. That, that's so good. Isn't it? There's a way in which this project is so in keeping with your other stuff because precisely of this, I think, to me, this is just so fascinating about the way you're thinking is that it's this privileging of space over time. And I think this, I think this touches on this whole relationship between realism and modernism, right? Like the, like modernism is really like the Rilke book is this, I think this the apotheosis of temporality, right? Like everything is, sh- everything is shifting. Everything is fleeting. I, I'm going to try to record the fleeting nature of my, of my existence. And then, I, but I think for Dickens, like it's all, about the spatiality, right? Like, I, and I think that's a really important idea. And I, I wonder, you know, it's so interesting because for someone like Lukacs, I think, who's who's very, this is so strange, I think, but but Lucian Goldman, a very, I think, smart Marxist made this point. He wrote a book called, I think it's called Lukacs and Heidegger. But there's this real link, I think, between Lukacs and Heidegger about time. And I think for Lukacs, spatialization is bourgeois thinking and that Marxism is really about getting us thinking historically and thus of ourselves as fundamentally temporal beings. So, so Lukács does, Lukács thinks that Marxism solves the problem that Heidegger lays out in being in time. Right. So, so I, I wonder about that, but I, 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 I was really seduced by that as a graduate student, but I think now I've totally come around to what you're saying about the attempt, like prioritizing the spatial and seeing the temporal is actually this. And I think for psychoanalysis, this is true about time as well, because I think psychoanalysis thinks time doesn't really matter, right? Like you're in, you just repeating some kind of structure over and over and over again. It doesn't matter if you're 10 or if you're 50, right? Like you're just, you continue to repeat it. So, which I think is great. And so I, I wonder if it has it been your in, the influence of psychoanalysis on you that's brought you to this understanding of the priority of space over time. And I think I'm representing your thought correctly. And I wonder if you could connect that even to this critique of immediacy today, because that seems like a embrace of the temporal as well, right? Right. 
Yeah, that's a great question. Um, I often think about myself as not having a like trajectory of my work, and then it makes me feel like I'm just like I'm still staying in an idiot. But it would be nice if there's some true line. But yeah, yeah, no, I think it's true. I think that's true. Uh, but okay, so there's several things. So one is um, the problem with the Lukashian frame that Marxism solves Heideggerianism with temporality or that Marxism orients us to temporality is that, yes, it is historical materialism. It wants us to be able to think about the contingencies of history and it wants us to think about the um, the phases of history and it wants us to think about our um, agency in the space of time to collectively you know, reorient things. But it is dialectical materialism, right? It also wants us to think about what structures um, temporal experience. And chiefly, you know, what is so radical about the account of capitalism that Marx provides is that it becomes a kind of anti-diachronic system, right? That that's what subsumption is. That's what totalization is. That is what um, structuration is. That is why it has its own metaphysical entailments, right? Its own kind of imminent causality and so on. And, um, so you there so I think that for Marxism you always have to like balance space time, you know, um, but that there is and then I think similarly the kind of realism, modernism opposition, it's very interesting to think about it as spatial and temporal because mm -hmm. usually yeah. a lot of the first theorists of modernism or the theorists in modernism and critics of modernism who wanted to turn it into an occasion for having form as against realist formlessness, um, they thought that they were on the side of space, that, you know, this Joseph Frank spatial form kind of notion right, right, that, right. Um, that form is a contour, form is a shape, form is a structure, and that that's spatial and, and not temporal, as opposed to realism's just sort of unfolding of too much plot and too much detail and too, and too long, you know? And it's in t it and it's in time, right? Like realism is, is, is takes a lot, usually takes more time than a modernist on. Right. Right. But I think the the other way to flip it that you were pointing to that and that I am very interested in is like, what is this principle that we were trying to formulate earlier about what is phenomenal and not phenomenal in realism versus modernism is that the attention in realism to this kind of cantilevering of um, the phenomenal with the structural or of the personal with the environmental or of individuals with their social classes or um, the psychological with the social, like that there is a, a effort to to think about the scale of social structuration in realism um, that I think is a very spatial or even architectural kind of mm -hmm. thinking. Um, and then, you know, what do we get in immediacy? A sense of um, identity that is coincident with itself, right? A sense of instantaneity, right. of um, temporality that is, um, you know, Comp like compressed, right? Yeah. Uh, that we can have it in an instant, um, that there's no friction in the transmission of data or of my message to you, you know, my emoji right. to you, so on, right? And um, so, you know, what is that, what are the axes of that spatio-temporally? Um, are they more temporal in their instantaneity than they are spatial? We have to figure that out because certainly flatness is one of the um, kind of cues of the, you know, Thomas Friedman, the world of flat. <laughs> right, right. Or, or like flat ontology, right? Like yeah, that's one of the dominant ways of thinking today, for sure, right? For sure, so, right. Yeah. And that, and so is that, is that, is planarity opposable to the volumes of space? I, I think, think so. so. That's what I would say, yeah. I think. Yeah. 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 That's a great, that's a, such a good answer. I think that's really true that, that, like, but I think you're right. It's I think it's to be analyzed. Like this, the the like the the way in which this being overrun by immediacy is that being like subsumed. I think I would say it's being subsumed to temporality, right? Like you're just and you're stuck in time and you can't get your spatial. Co I mean, this is why it's interesting. Like Jameson, you do a little bit with this his notion of cognitive mapping. You know that that, and I think that. That is an attempt to get yourself oriented spatially, although I've never really seen inclusive of him anyone like actually do the analysis of how a cognitive map works. So I know, I, I love the idea, but every time like Slavoj refers to it all the time and I'm like, well, you're not really doing it. And right. Jameson, like he, he'll say something like these paranoid thrillers of the 70s, they do this cognitive mapping. But then when he reads 
parallax view, he doesn't really show how it's doing any cognitive mapping. So I don't know. I, I found that it's one of those concepts that seems so great and then never, right. I never have gotten the payoff. But anyway, um, oh. let's talk about, let's talk about like a, a some just fun at the end here. Let's, so, so Dickens, so, uh, so Bleak House, I, I want to just mention this because I think your chapter on Bleak House I thought was tremendous. And I wonder if you can just say what you think like this notion of the limit in Dickens and you can say what he's allowing us to see about the limit in Bleak House and and maybe if you can relate that to the narration because I think the narration is maybe the thing that stands out about that novel most of all. For sure. So okay so we just said like maybe we want to think about realism in spatial terms and because it has this unrepentantly social interest, right? It wants to know, like, how does this social world hang together? Where do these people belong? What are the social possibilities that they can attain or not? Um, you know, what are the social differences that the, the narration is going to somehow bridge? And and in Bleak House, it's amazing because you really get these kind of some, well, I shouldn't say seminal, but, you know, seminal and cinematic indeed, as avowed by all kinds of people, moments of producing narration as the crows fly, omnipotent, omniscient view that is able to link one side of the city to the other side of the city, right? Um, mm -hmm. To uh, to perceive social structuration, right? And um, nonetheless, in this incredible expansiveness of this novel that everybody thinks is like, you know, the most realist novel ever, the biggest you know, novel ever, there's all this kind of actual delimitation and minutia. There are so many characters in this book. Literary critics have tried to count how many characters there are. <laughs> But there's only a few we really focus on. There yeah. is the entire city of London. London is arguably the protagonist of all of Dickens' novels. And yet there's so few spaces in this novel, so few. There's very little that scenes that take place outside. You know, it almost all takes place in Bleak House, <laughs> the other Bleak House, <laughs> the Chancery Court, or a, a, Tom Holland's, a few little places, right, that we go to again and again and again. There's one journey on the road. There's a chase at the end, right? Like yeah. that. You know. Right. Um, and so there's this kind of interesting contradiction that the book had puts together, I think, between its kind of expansiveness and its um, ambitions to tell us all kinds of um, social and psychological truths, right, and political and financial truths, and then um, its interest in the small and in replicating um, the kind of limits to where it cannot go or to, to what it can't contain even if it's thousand pages. And the narration, which is so radical because it's the first time in the history of English fiction that there is a novel that is split between first and third person and it alternates but not precisely and not predictably. And um, the, the narrative split right, is one of these, I think, I think is a kind of aestheticization and attempt to find a form of like, how do you think about limitation? How do you think about the bound beyond which you do not know, right? And then even a third person has limits that it doesn't know, even though we've exercised third person in the 19th century novel as a kind of um, experiment with more than what you can know, you know. Uh, I shouldn't have said, you know. <laughs> <laughs> So I just think that it's it's this it, the contradiction between expansiveness and diminution or delimitation um, between uh, what can go on forever and what has to meet its end yeah. um, is is really interestingly related to the fact that it's a book about houses and the law. Um, the lawsuit, right? Right. I mean, the lawsuit actually embodies the very contradiction you're talking about because it's this incredibly expansive thing, and then we see it like cut there's a cut in it at the end of the novel right so which ends up coming to nothing which is fascinating right. yeah that it, yeah right. yeah that's pretty great um so i just that's some just fun questions so so for you is the, is bleak house the great dickens novel for you the oh. top one Oh, I think actually our mutual friend is better. Our mutual friend. Okay. Interesting. Okay. Uh, and your favorite too? It's your favorite? I think it's my favorite. Yeah. It's just, um, it's unremittingly beautiful and bleak. And it is um, the way that it thinks about capitalism more explicitly than um, Bleak House. Not that I hold things to the standard of explicit, but its sense about capitalism is about waste and about recycling, yeah, yeah, recuperations, and about masquerades, and about weird circuits and personification, and yeah. like you know, it, it's like a book about the tropes of capitalism. I guess I yeah. used to say, um, and 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 drive, 
you know, and yeah, then, no, I agree. I just think it would have been my favorite novel that I've ever read. If the one, if the guy didn't convert, if he wasn't the masquerade actually bothered me that the guy, because I thought it was about the way that getting capital, like totally changed, like it, it determines, but then it's not, it, it, what's the guy's name? Is it Bobbins or? Oh yeah. Boffin. Yeah. Boffin. Yeah. 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 So that, that, that bothered me. And then I, I just got so upset about that, that I couldn't, that I, 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 when I was before his conversion or, but it wasn't a conversion. It was just a revelation of who he really was. I, I thought, man, this is just the, for all the reasons you're saying, I just, I loved it. And I thought, yeah, it's the best exploration of capital. But then I thought it kind of, I thought that was a kind of a, a cop out. Yeah. There's a moralizing tendency in Dickens, right? To, there's a tendency to um, want things to come to where they're due. And um, capitalism doesn't quite work that way. And it's um, it's a way that you can think about him as Dickens as struggling from Oliver Twist to, you know, the end with a question of like, what's romance and what's realism, right? Do things, is there a, a, a order that is um, owable <laughs> or is there a counts deferred, you know, like <laughs> yeah. Yeah. do things, um, come back around and and um, a certain kind of quality of um, moral um, deservingness is sometimes the like ideological kind of like characterological instantiation of that reconciliation and capitalism yeah. is about not reckoning you know so right. it's it, right. so it, which means that it's hard to have a novel about capitalism because right? Right. Um, you have to end yeah. yeah 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 that's really good so so what about what about theorist who's the theorist for is it marx is the top for you like if you're you're on a desert island you only get one who do oh, you get you all the time yeah all the time you just you're you just have one to be alone on the island it probably would have to be freud not marx Freud, not Marx. okay let's end with that freud not marx <laughs> okay uh Thank you so much. This is great. It was a really, I had so much fun talking to you. So fun always to talk to you. I learned so much from you. Okay. Well, nah, you didn't learn from me. We learned from you. So thank you. That was thank great. Okay. Okay. Take care.